Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to look at a bit of meta aesthetics. So we routinely make judgments about aesthetic value. You know, we say that artworks are good or bad, beautiful or ugly. But what is the nature of aesthetic value? You know, what, what is the goodness of an artwork. Uh, in this video, I'm going to outline aesthetic realism, which holds that there are mind-independent facts about aesthetic value. M more precisely, the aesthetic realist affirms three claims. So first, uh, cognitivism. The aesthetic realist says that aesthetic judgments, such as uh, X is aesthetically good, or X is beautiful, or X is better than Y, uh, these judgments express beliefs, right? So when I say that an artwork is beautiful, I'm expressing a belief about the properties of the artwork. And, uh, you know, these beliefs can be true or false. Second, the aesthetic realist says that some of these beliefs are true. So there are truths about aesthetic value. When I say that, you know, the film 2001 A Space Odyssey is beautiful, that belief is true. Um, and then finally, these beliefs are made true by mind-independent facts. So facts, there's facts about the artwork that are independent of the responses of any actual or hypothetical agent. So basically the aesthetic realist says that we, we track the facts, we discover the facts about aesthetic value, we do not create such facts. Contrary to the common slogan, beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. Uh, just as it is a fact, regardless of what anybody happens to think about it, that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth, so it is a fact, regardless of what anybody happens to think about it, that Mount Everest is beautiful. It would remain beautiful even if nobody appreciated it. Similarly, it's a fact, regardless of what anybody happens to think about it, that Picasso's Guernica is a brilliant artwork. It would remain brilliant even if nobody appreciated its brilliance. So this is basically what the aesthetic realist is, is saying, right? We, we discover mind-independent facts about aesthetic value. Now, with this said, we can, uh, we can note a few alternative positions. Um, so, I mean, I've sort of, I've, I've put aesthetic realism, uh, I've, I've framed it as uh, affirming these three claims. Um, so the alternatives we can think of as denying any of these three claims. Uh, if we deny the first claim, if we deny cognitivism, then we have aesthetic non-cognitivism. Uh, now, according to the aesthetic non-cognitivist, judgments about aesthetic value uh, do not express beliefs. Uh, rather, aesthetic judgments express attitudes. So, when I say Guernica is a masterpiece, that means something like, yay to Guernica, right? It's, it's just a, a kind of emotion. It's like an emotive expression of a positive response towards Guernica. I'm not trying to attribute the property of masterpiecehood to Guernica. I'm not saying it has the property of artistic goodness. I'm just expressing my own attitudes towards it. Uh, if we affirm cognitivism, but we deny the second claim, then we have aesthetic error theory. According to the aesthetic error theorist, all judgments about aesthetic value are false. Our aesthetic judgments presuppose that there are these aesthetic values, but actually there are no such values. So, you know, so, so yeah, they're just, they're just all false, right? Guernica is a masterpiece is false. Guernica is terrible is also false um, because there's just, there just is no aesthetic goodness or badness. Uh, finally, we might grant that there are uh, aesthetic truths, but then we might deny that these aesthetic truths are made true by mind-independent aesthetic facts. Rather, aesthetic facts are response-dependent. So, you know, it's true that Mount Everest is beautiful, it's true that Guernica is a masterpiece, but what makes these propositions true are the judgments of actual or hypothetical observers. Something along these lines is probably the most common position among philosophers of art. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is just, obviously, this is very brief and simplified. This is just an initial characterization of some of the positions available. If you've seen any of my videos on meta-ethics, uh, then you'll be familiar with uh, the conceptual landscape here. As we will see, many of the issues that arise concerning the nature of, uh, of aesthetic value have parallels in the debates in meta-ethics about the nature of moral value. Um, now, I mean, in meta-ethics, uh, moral realism is the most common position. There are far fewer 
philosophers who accept aesthetic realism as as it's defined here. Um, so I suppose the first question is, well, why should we take aesthetic realism seriously? Why believe this? Uh, Dan Evers, in his article uh, Aesthetic Non-Naturalism, suggests that the aesthetic realist can appeal to the same sorts of considerations that are often taken to support moral realism in metaethics. Um, and in particular, we can uh, we can argue that aesthetic realism provides the best account of certain features of uh, our sort of thought and discourse about uh, about aesthetics. So here are some of these features. Um, so first of all, there is the phenomenology of aesthetic judgment. Uh, so this is sort of what it's like from the you know when we, when we talk about the phenomenology here, we're talking about like okay, the, just the first person point of view of like what it's like to make an aesthetic judgment. So aesthetic properties like beauty are experienced as independent of us. Um, that's how they sort of manifest in, in experience. So, you know, it seems more like I'm detecting aesthetic value than that I'm making up aesthetic value. So just think about what it's like to engage with the work of art, okay? When I watch the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, it seems like the film itself is good. It doesn't seem as if I'm deciding that it's good. Indeed, to some extent, it's, like I can't do this, right? I I, uh, I can't just decide that the film is bad instead. Um, you know, my so like when I experience art and aesthetics, this is not an experience of encountering a kind of barren world bereft of value and then projecting aesthetic value onto it by you know consulting my aesthetic my aesthetic uh, attitudes rather the value is just right there i'm just struck by the value of things um so that is i don't think to myself you know when i'm watching say 2001 i don't think to myself well you know i approve of xyz um this is what you know, uh, and, and then I see that 2001 exemplifies X, Y, Z, so I should approve of 2001. There's not that kind of reasoning. Rather, you know, I watch 2001 and then I, I just sort of experience, uh, I experience its goodness. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, I can, I can sort of think more about it and reason about it and deliberate about it. And then maybe I will, I will sort of discover other ways in which it's good. But at no point in this process is there the feeling of like, okay, I'm projecting this, uh, I'm, I'm like making it the case that 2001 is good. Um, second, there is the surface grammar of aesthetic judgments. So aesthetic judgments have a kind of propositional form. When I say the proposition 2001 A Space Odyssey is Stanley Kubrick's best film, well, this has the form of a sentence that predicates a property of an object, right? It's, you know, th the best film of Stanley Kubrick. I'm, I'm saying that this film has this property and it's therefore analogous to uh, sentences like Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth. Um, it's, it's quite different from a mere expression of attitude. You know, if I say like, yay to 2001 or a report of attitudes, like I love 2001. I mean, I can say those things as well, but when I say, 2001 A Space Odyssey is Stanley Kubrick's best film, well, that has quite a different form, you know. I'm not actually saying anything about, I mean, at least if we just take the, the sort of prima facie surface form of that statement, I'm not saying anything about my attitudes there. I'm saying this film has this property. Um, and some of these, these propositions, you know, some propositions like 2001 A Space Odyssey is Stanley Kubrick's best film, some of those propositions seem to be true. Third, we argue about aesthetic value where this seems to involve genuine disagreements um, and this seems to involve attempts to establish the facts. So I might say that the Rothko painting is beautiful and then you say no the Rothko that painting is just a pretentious joke. I think that you're missing something important about the painting. You think that I've been you know fooled by an artistic charlatan. Um, this is a genuine disagreement now, it may not be a particularly pressing disagreement. It may not be important that the disagreement is resolved. Perhaps we can kind of just tolerate that, all right, we have different attitudes here, different attitudes to art. But still, there is a genuine conflict of views here. And, you know, we don't normally use 
uh, sort of relativizing clauses when talking about this. So we don't usually say things like, well, the Rothko painting is a good artwork for Kane, but it's not a good artwork for Frank. No, I mean, I just say the Rothko painting is good. And if you disagree, um, you know, and, 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 and like, you know, if you feel, if you, if you think differently about it, then you genuinely disagree with me. Um, if when I say that the Rothko painting is good, I was really saying something like um, the Rothko painting is good from Kane's perspective or it's good according to Kane, then there couldn't really be any genuine disagreement about that. I mean, there's not, you're not disputing that I like the Rothko painting, you're disputing that the Rothko painting is good. We're disputing the properties of the Rothko painting. What's in dispute here is not, you know, my reaction to the painting. What's in dispute is the properties of the painting itself. Fourth, some aesthetic judgments seem clearly to be mistaken. Uh, David Hume once famously wrote, and I quote, whoever would assert an equality of genius and elegance between Ogilby and Milton, or Bunyan and Addison, and of course these were famous writers in Hume's time, and I mean some of them also in our time, Milton's still famous in our time, but you know Ogilby is a, a rubbish writer basically uh, from Hume's, Hume's time. Um, so anyway, whoever would assert an equality of genius between Ogilby and Milton would be thought to defend no less an extravagance than if he had maintained a molehill to be as high as Tenerife, or a pond extensive as the ocean, right? So there are just certain claims that people make about art where it's almost baffling that they would say them. You know, it's in the same way that it would be baffling for someone to say that, you know, this pile of sand is as high as a mountain. Um, you know, it would be just ridiculous for me to claim that I am a better composer than Frank Zappa. It's clear that the works of Frank Zappa have aesthetically valuable properties while my attempts at music are totally pathetic. Uh, and it would just be incorrect to deny this. Um, people can be right or wrong in their judgments of aesthetic value. Fifth, people draw a distinction between personal taste and objective value. So they draw a distinction between their favourite artworks and the best artworks. Like, a person might say, you know, look, I prefer listening to the Beatles, but Frank Zappa was a better musician. That seems totally coherent, uh, you know, I mean, like we, you know, that's a, that's a perfectly normal thing to say. Or I might say, yeah, Frank Zappa was a brilliant musician, but I personally don't like him. Or, you know, the Eiger Mountain is beautiful, but I personally don't like it. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which, like, one's personal idiosyncrasies can kind of, you know, di diverge from the aesthetic value judgments. Like, maybe, uh, a person was like visiting the Eiger when their mother died, so they have bad memories associated with it. So, you know, that's why they don't personally like the Eiger, but they recognize its beauty. Or, you know, I mean, maybe I, I have a kid, like I have a kid and I love my child and then my child produces a music composition and I'm just, you know, just so impressed by what they've done. I'm like, okay, I, I just love this thing and I, I love listening to it more than I love listening to Frank Zappa, even though I recognise that, of course, Frank Zappa is better. This is, um, again, this is quite normal. Noel Car Carroll once said, and I quote, I have no trouble seeing that a novel like William Golding's Rites of Passage is very good, miles above anything by Stephen King, a bad writer whose books I buy obsessively. I may enjoy King while judging him to be inferior to Golding as a writer. Um, so if aesthetic judgments are merely expressions of our own attitudes of approval and disapproval, or if aesthetic judgments are made true by our own attitudes, these sorts of statements would be very puzzling. There shouldn't be any distinction between, you know, personal likes and dislikes and our judgments of good or bad art. But we do draw this distinction. We judge aesthetic value independently of our own affective responses. Affective responses. Emotional responses. Um, finally, here's a, a famous thought experiment from G.E. Moore. Uh, he initially used this in a slightly different context, but uh, it works here. So imagine two worlds, both of which contain no observers. The first world is full of mountains, canyons, pristine lakes and rivers, and lush forests. The second world contains nothing but piles of ash. Now, notice that it wouldn't really make any sense to say, for instance, that the apples from the trees in the first world are tastier than the ash in the second world. 
Yeah, tastiness is clearly something that's dependent on observers, right? Like if I, you know, finding something tasty is a matter of how uh, I react to it. Uh, it's a matter of how it, it, how my taste buds respond or whatever. But by contrast, Moore suggests, the first world is more beautiful than the second world. Um, so the first world is aesthetically better than the second. And this is despite the fact that by stipulation, there are no observers in these worlds to project the beauty, to project the aesthetic value onto them. So there is at least a difference between the concept of aesthetic goodness and the concept that something, you know, causes positive aesthetic reactions. Because, uh, you know, what, what Moore says that this shows, um, or, you know, what we might take this to be showing, is that aesthetic goodness can be instantiated even when there's nobody around to have a positive reaction to it. Um, it doesn't seem in the same way that something like tastiness could be instantiated even when there's nobody around to have a positive reaction to it. But, you know, beauty, aesthetic goodness, those look like things that, you know, could be independent of observers. Um, so, so th these are um, these are some of the reasons uh, why we might defend uh, a kind of aesthetic realism. According to Evers, at least, these kinds of considerations shift the burden of proof to the aesthetic anti-realist, just as in metaethics, again, if you're familiar with metaethics, you'll you'll be aware that moral realists appeal to similar factors to say that the burden of proof is shifted to the moral anti-realist. Taken at face value, our discourse about art and aesthetics is realist. We presuppose that there are facts about aesthetic value. Just as taken at face value, our discourse about morality is realist. We presuppose that there are moral facts. Um, so, you know, there's, there's various aspects of our, of our discourse about aesthetics that betray a more objectivist view. And then the claim will be that aesthetic realism provides the best account of these features of the discourse. Um, aesthetic realism is perhaps the best explanation of these features or, you know, it's sort of, you know, these, these are just certain kind of common sense features of our discourse that, you know, any any reasonable theory needs to accommodate and uh, aesthetic realism very straightforwardly accommodates them. Uh, you know, so other things being equal, we should accept the theory that accommodates the commitments uh, uh, outlined here. Um, now, personally, I don't believe that there are objective aesthetic values, but if there were, I have no doubt that my Patreon would be among the things that are objectively aesthetically good. Um, well, actually, that's a lie. I don't know if it's objectively aesthetically good, but maybe it's interesting because uh, I upload further thoughts on things on my Patreon. So if you want to see more of me, you can join the Patreon, give me some money, and then you get more from Kane B. Or if you, you know, if you just want to support the channel, throw me a donation on PayPal. I also offer private tutoring about philosophy. Um, I have a degree, a master's, a PhD in philosophy, so those are my qualifications. And I have a Discord. The links for all of this will be in the description. But let's move on. Um, so, despite everything I've just said, there is an immediate challenge to aesthetic realism. And this contrasts with the case for moral realism. Uh, many moral realists argue that moral realism is the common sense position and that this provides some reason to favour moral realism. Uh, so, you know, ordinary people are moral realists. Um, now, as we've seen, the aesthetic realist may argue that our thought and discourse about aesthetic value has implicit realist commitments. But it's much less plausible that ordinary people explicitly endorse aesthetic realism. I, I think among both laypersons and philosophers, it's pretty common for people to affirm more subjectivist views about aesthetic value. As noted, there's that common phrase that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, look, I'm not aware, I, I haven't done <laughs> the uh, the empirical work on this, but uh, it at least initially seems like, yeah, there's probably a lot of people who are more subjectivist uh, in their views about um, about aesthetic value. And this leads us to the primary objection to aesthetic realism, which is what Elizabeth Trotman in her article, How to Be an Aesthetic Realist, calls the overly objective worry. The concern is this, you know, on the one hand, we, we do often think that judgments of aesthetic value are objective in some sense, as explained earlier, and aesthetic realism nicely accommodates this aspect of our aesthetic discourse. But on the other, it seems implausible that aesthetic value is completely independent of us. 
that it's completely independent of our senses and our cognitive machinery uh, in the way that the aesthetic realist seems to claim. So, you know, we can say like, yeah, aesthetic realism accommodate, you know, it, it gives us the basis for saying that aesthetic value is objective, but it's like overly objective. We don't want it to be too objective and the aesthetic realist makes it too objective. So here's one way to bring out this worry. If our sensory and cognitive capacities were significantly different, surely different things would be beautiful to us. So imagine a race of aliens that have very different visual systems. For them, Picasso's Guernica may not be a particularly powerful painting, even if they were aware of all of the relevant context of it. The painting would look completely different to them. Maybe it would just look like an unfocused mess. Uh, similarly for a race of aliens with different auditory systems. Steve, Steve Reicher's Music for 18 Musicians may not be beautiful. Um, now, if an ordinary human being fails to appreciate Guernica or fails to appreciate Music for 18 Musicians, maybe we'll, we'll say, yeah, they've made an error. But that seems pretty implausible if we're talking about alien beings with very different capacities. It seems quite natural to say that what's beautiful for us may not be beautiful for the aliens, and, you know, neither of us is in error. So aesthetic value can't be completely independent of us. Aesthetic value is relative to our minds in some sense. There's some sort of relativity um, to minds here that the realist apparently doesn't respect. Um, I mean, I guess the, the broader point here is that aesthetic value is dependent, dependent on sensory properties like colours and sounds. And we might think that colours and sounds are subjective. I mean, they're not completely independent of us because they depend on the specific functioning of the human perceptual system. A person who is red-green colourblind is not going to appreciate a painting in the same way that I do. So, you know, it looks like that the aesthetic realism in the sense defined here is just a non-starter. However, as we've elaborated the overly objective worry so far, Tropman argues that it rests on a misunderstanding of aesthetic realism. So according to Tropman, Aesthetic realism does not claim that aesthetic value is independent of absolutely everything about us. We need to distinguish different kinds of mind independence. All the aesthetic realist claims is that aesthetic value is independent of our aesthetic judgments and attitudes. Aesthetic value need not be independent from our perceptual capacities. So we have to distinguish uh, response independence from perceptual capacity independence. Aesthetic realism is only committed to response independence. And it's useful to compare this to moral realism. I mean, clearly, the moral realist should not say that moral value is independent of absolutely everything about us, such as our capacities for pain and pleasure. I mean, you know, why, for instance, is it wrong to enslave other people? Well, very plausibly, part of what makes this wrong is that slavery causes suffering and You know, that's a contingent fact about us. If we had different mental capacities, perhaps slavery would not cause suffering. I mean, surely it's conceivable that there could be beings that just don't have the capacity to suffer, in which case it wouldn't be wrong, or at least it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be wrong in the same way. Uh, so, you know, even if it would still be wrong, it would be wrong for different reasons. So the wrongness of slavery is not independent from all features of our minds. What the moral realist claims is that the wrongness of slavery is independent from our judgments and attitudes about slavery. Even if our society approved of slavery, even if we judged that slavery was acceptable, as many societies did in the past, slavery would still be wrong. And it would be wrong partly because it imposes a great deal of suffering on others. So with that said then, we can consider the case of aesthetic value. Um, the aesthetic value of Picasso's Guernica is dependent on the particular arrangement of colours, and that is dependent on our visual systems. Organisms with different visual systems would not perceive such colours, but the aesthetic value of Guernica is not dependent on our aesthetic judgments or our aesthetic attitudes about that arrangement of colours. So in other words, for the alien with different sensory systems, the aesthetic value of Picasso's Guernica is just undetectable. Um, but that's not surprising many objective properties are undetectable. I mean, we can't perceptually detect the neutrino flux from the sun, but there's still an objective fact of the matter about that. Um, so, the 
I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, another sort of way to look at this is we, we might say that the specific functioning of our perceptual systems makes a difference to whether the aesthetic value is accessible to us. Given that we have certain arrangements of colour, like given the arrangement of colour that we find in Picasso's Guernica, uh, as viewed from the normal human visual system, there is a fact of the matter about its aesthetic value. But those arrangements of colour will only be accessible to organisms with the right sensory systems. Humans recognise that Guernica is good and that aliens do not recognise this because our species are not detecting the same properties of Guernica. In order to detect the value, the aesthetic value, of particular patterns of sensory experiences, you have to have those experiences. Um, but the fact that those experiential properties are good is what's objective. And that fact is not dependent on our judgments or attitudes about those experiences. Right? Similarly, in order to you know, detect the, the moral value of, of certain experiences, you have to have those experiences, right? Um, you know, the, the bad, like the fact that the, bad, the, the badness of the suffering caused by slavery, right? The fact that the suffering caused by slavery is bad, that's what's objective. Um, and that fact is not dependent on our judgments or attitudes about the experiences. Um, so, having made this clarification, maybe this removes the worry that aesthetic realism is overly objective. But there are other points that the, um, you know, that might be made about this. I mean, so there's also what we might call the, the subjectivity intuition, I mean, just a more general subjectivity intuition, as expressed in the phrase that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, even once we have have this distinction between response dependence and perceptual capacity dependence, most people probably still find moral realism more plausible than aesthetic realism. And, you know, why is this, right? Why, why is there this difference? Why do people, uh, why are people so attracted to anti-realist views of aesthetics? The aesthetic realist needs to explain why subjectivist views of aesthetic value are so compelling to people. Um, and of course, there's a lot we might say here. I mean, you know, uh, there's many possible explanations we could give for, you know, why people are attracted to aesthetic anti-realism. Um, I just want to float one suggestion. But again, you know, there's all sorts of <laughs> there's all sorts of things we might say. So this is just one suggestion. One suggestion we might make is just this. Look, moral facts are more serious than aesthetic facts. Moral facts matter in a way that the aesthetic facts do not. So try to compare the aesthetically worst art imaginable with the morally worst behaviour imaginable. Uh, it just isn't really a big deal if somebody creates bad art, um, but moral violations are very serious indeed. Uh, I mean, it would seem almost tasteless to, uh, I mean, making this comparison, you know, being like, well, you know, compare Plan 9 from Outer Space with the Holocaust, right? That kind of seems a bit tasteless. Um, so for most people, most of the time, aesthetic value just doesn't matter. Uh, you know, when I watch a movie, maybe I just want something that I can enjoy. That, that's it. All I'm interested in is just enjoying myself. I'm not concerned about film criticism. I'm not concerned about objective aesthetic properties. Maybe I'll analyse the film a little, discuss it with others try to figure out its themes and its context in film history but then again maybe not sometimes I just want to have fun and that's that I want to you know switch my mind off and uh, be entertained um, so and that's fine right it's perfectly fine to, to do that uh, it's fine to take pleasure in an aesthetically bad film so aesthetic value is avoidable in this sense whereas moral value isn't right it isn't similarly acceptable to say well i just kind of don't care about the moral facts i just want to have fun uh <laughs> that would uh you know it's like okay you know i I'm, I'm enslaving this person because yeah i mean it's morally bad but i don't really care about that i'm just i'm just trying to enjoy myself right now and i kind of enjoy having slaves uh that's not similarly acceptable so aesthetic value sort of doesn't matter most of the time, whereas we think that moral facts do. Similarly, aesthetic value doesn't matter in the way that certain empirical facts matter. Um, the fact that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain, that makes a practical difference to how we interact with Mount Everest. So let's say I need to get from one side of Mount Everest to the other. Well, the fact that it's the tallest mountain, um, that's going to make a difference to whether I try to go over it or go around it. Uh, whereas the fact that Mount Everest is beautiful, that's a very little practical concern. So 
with that in mind, then we might say, well, part of what drives the intuition that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, maybe this is just because most of the time it doesn't matter whether people track objective aesthetic value. We can tolerate disagreement about aesthetic value because it makes no practical difference in the way that, you know, moral disagreement and disagreement and empirical facts make a practical disagree, make a practical difference. Like we kind of have to, um, there, there is a lot of pressure on us to form agreement about the moral facts and about the empirical facts. That makes a difference to how we act and how we behave with each other. Whereas, you know, our judgments about aesthetics is, that can just be a sort of private thing and it, it really doesn't matter that much. So maybe that's what counts that's what accounts for the intuition that aesthetic value is subjective. I mean, this might be playing a role. Um, but as I said, you know, that's just a, a suggestion. So <clears throat> let's consider a couple more objections to aesthetic realism. Um, I mean, the standard objections here are, are really going to be familiar from debates in metaethics, because as I mentioned, worries about objective aesthetic values are parallel to worries about objective moral values. So first of all then there is the argument from aesthetic disagreement. Um, there is a great deal of disagreement in judgments of aesthetic value and this disagreement persists even among informed critics. A painting that one critic sees as elegant and beautiful another might view as dull and derivative. And sometimes these disagreements are just intractable. You know we reach a point where it doesn't seem like there's any further information that's going to shift the judgments of the people who are disputing. So why, right? Why is there so much apparently irresolvable disagreement? Well, the aesthetic anti-realist might say that the best explanation we have for the patterns of aesthetic judgments that people make, the best explanation for this is that these judgments reflect social conventions and personal idiosyncrasies. Not that they are, you know, more or less reliable detections of objective aesthetic value. I mean, if they're, if we were detecting objective aesthetic value, why are we so bad at coming to agreement about it? Um, and why do our aesthetic judgments correlate so closely with our own cultural background and personal idiosyncratic tastes? So this is this is a, a, a common problem. Um, now, in response to this, the aesthetic realist can make the same moves that moral realists make in response to the problem of moral disagreement. So first of all, the aesthetic realist can downplay the extent of disagreement. There are actually general rules of thumb that most people accept about what makes an artwork good or bad. Um, there are also general rules of thumb about how to, you know, um, instantiate more specific aesthetic properties like beauty and I mean this is how artists can reliably provoke particular reactions in their audiences right um, you know we kind of know how to uh, we, we, we know what sorts of things to do we know what kinds of arrangements of color um, look good uh, and, and and you know there, there are general rules of thumb about that not you know I mean they're not going to be like hard and fast um, you know principles but there are general rules of thumb that broadly speaking most people can agree on moreover although yes there are these cases of seemingly irresolvable disputes there are also cases where there's pretty much universal agreement um for instance almost nobody thinks that my scribble on a notebook is of equal value to picasso's guernica um i mean even people who don't personally like the painting will often still recognize that it has um, you know, greater value than just someone's scribble in a notebook. Um, second, where disagreement does occur, it may be due to irrelevant factors. Properly appreciating an artwork requires knowledge of art history and the broader social context of the artwork. Often when people disagree about aesthetic value, it's because one of them just isn't appropriately informed. A person raised in a Western country may be dismissive of traditional African art because they just haven't been taught the appropriate background facts for appreciating it. A person unfamiliar with modern classical and electronic music may dismiss Stockhausen's contact as random noises. Uh, but, you know, we don't really put much stock in that person's opinion because it's just like, well, you know, you're, you're just not aware of like what this artwork was doing or the context in which it was made. And that's kind of important to appreciating any kind of artwork. So when we assess how much you know, disagreement there is, we have to look at like relevant disagreement. Um, and to do that, we need to consider the opinions of informed and 
careful critics. Um, and once we do that, the argument would go, we're going to find that there's actually much more convergence. There's not, there's not as much disagreement as it might initially seem. Um, another point that we could make here is, you know, the aesthetic realist can grant that there are just going to be cases where, you know, the facts are sort of vague or indeterminate. So let's say that I, I might say Stockhausen is superior to Zenicus. But then you say that Zenicus is superior to Stockhausen. And we find that this disagreement is irresolvable. You know, we, we just we, we reach a, a sort of wall and, you know, that it doesn't seem like either of us can appeal to anything to change the other person's mind. Well, maybe the reason why this disagreement is irresolvable is that that's just not really a fact of the matter. Both Stockhausen and Zenicus are equally great composers. Stockhausen is superior in some ways, Zenicus is superior in others. But there's, there isn't actually anything that, you know, decides, like, exactly how to weight the different, um, you know, good making features of Stockhausen and Zenicus's work. And so, you know, it's, and ultimately this, this is a case where it really just does come down to sort of personal taste, which one you like. I mean, similarly in the moral case, there need not always be a fact of the matter whether one action is better than another, right? I mean, is it better to donate to, you know, charity A or charity B? Maybe both of those actions are equally acceptable. You know, we can say, like, both of these actions are good, um, and, you know, charity A is better in some ways, charity B is better in some ways, but there's no facts of the matter about, like, which is the better one. So um, you're not going to, you know, resolve the, the disagreement here um, between, you know, one person who prefers charity A and the other who prefers charity B. It's enough for the aesthetic realist that we can say, for instance, well, Stockhausen is objectively better than a five-year-old bashing a piano. Um, even though there are vague or indeterminate cases, there are still going to be some cases um, that are that are perfectly clear and determinate, right? Um, so this is, these are some of the moves that we might make in response to the argument from disagreement. Another uh, argument is... The queerness argument. Uh, again, you know, this is very famous from, from meta-ethics. So as J.L. Mackey states the queerness argument, he says, if there were objective values, then they would be entities or qualities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. So basically, what on earth are these objective aesthetic properties? Uh, what what could they be? Like, what could objective aesthetic goodness be? This requires that there's somehow values without valuers, and that seems kind of strange, especially for those of us with more, you know, naturalistic attitudes. We might say, look, our best theories about the world come from empirical science, and what the scientists tell us is that the world consists of arrangements of fermions and bosons. You know, and there just doesn't seem to be any room here for objective aesthetic values. I mean, certainly there is no, you know, there is no kind of empirical science of, of objective aesthetic values. It's not like you can say, OK, um, you know, look through the microscope. There's the objective aesthetic goodness. Right. It's not like we, you know, we have physicists saying, right, here's the the aesthetic goodness particle, um, <coughs> you know, that we've discovered in the particle accelerator. Obviously, it doesn't work like that. Um, <coughs> but. You know, it's, it's hard to say to see how, you know, just arrangements of fermions and bosons could in themselves be aesthetically good or bad. Um, and moreover, we can we can explain our judgments about aesthetic value perfectly well in terms of the the non evaluative properties of artworks. And then our effective responses to such properties. Right. So when I say that, you know, like when I say, for instance, that you know, Guernica is good. Okay, well, we can explain what's caused me to produce that judgment by just uh, e examining the sort of, you know, the, 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 the properties of Guernica, the arrangement of colours of Guernica, um, then by sort of looking at how that has affected my brain states, and then that causes me to say something, right? So, I mean, obviously, this, this would be, a, a you know, that's just a very brief sketch of an explanation. But it looks like we can explain everything about our aesthetic judgments without appealing to the notion of objective aesthetic values. We can we can just explain this in terms of, you know, um, non-evaluative properties of things in the world and then how I'm responding to those properties. So by postulating objective aesthetic values, that does seem to 
fly in the face of Occam's razor. Um, you know, ordinary non-evaluative properties will do the job. So uh, don't multiply entities beyond necessity. Okay, now there are many ways of elaborating the queerness argument. Uh, I have a video uh, called The Queerness Argument for Moral Realism, which I, I, I discuss some of these ways of elaborating it. I'll link that in the comments. I think it's worth noting, however, that arguably the queerness argument does not pose such a problem for aesthetic realists, um, because arguably there are sources of moral queerness that do not arise in the aesthetic case. So here's one uh, way to push this point. On one quite popular framing of the queerness argument, the problem with moral facts is that such facts, if they existed, would involve categorical reasons. Um, so actually Mackey seems to suggest this at times. Richard Joyce has suggested this. Um, so moral facts give us reasons for action where these reasons are independent of any of our desires and goals. So if we think about um, a non-moral case, right, let's say that it's raining and I say you ought to put on a coat, right? The fact that it is raining gives you a reason to put on a coat. Now, we can easily explain this in, you know, non-normative terms. What I'm saying here, basically, is uh, you desire to put, you desire to stay dry, okay? Putting on a coat is a means of staying dry and putting on a coat doesn't frustrate any of your other desires. So, when, when I make this claim about what you ought to do, this, this ought, this reason, can be reduced to a claim about your desires and the means of satisfying those desires. And so many claims about what we ought to do or about what we have reason to do are really claims about desires and means and relationships. Um, and so, you know, that's perfectly fine, right? That's not, that's not queer. Um, that's not strange. But this isn't the case for moral facts. So consider a moral claim, right? You ought not to own slaves. Well, that's the case regardless of whether owning slaves satisfies any of your desires. The fact that slavery causes suffering is a reason not to own slaves. And this is so regardless of whether owning slaves, you know, is regardless of whether you care about their suffering. You might say, well, look, I just don't care about suffering. I, I'm fine causing suffering to people. Well, you know, so what? Um, you, know, you still ought not to do it. You still ought not to own slaves. The fact that own, the fact that slavery causes suffering, that's still a reason not to do it. Um, so, uh, it, you know, for, so, so what we have here is like, we, we have this kind of obligation, this ought claim, this reason where this isn't, where this isn't something that can be cashed out in terms of just desires and means of satisfying those desires. And for many moral anti-realists, what's queer about morality is that it involves these categorical reasons, these categorical oughts. But notice that, at least prima facie, it doesn't look like we think about aesthetic values in the same kind of way. So whereas in the case of morality, there are both moral values and also moral obligations, in the case of aesthetics, it looks like there's only aesthetic values and not aesthetic obligations. Let's say that I'm a painter and I'm considering using a particularly vivid shade of blue for the sky. And this would ruin an otherwise good painting. It would make it very tacky. You might well tell me, look, you ought not to use that vivid shade of blue. But that seems to be dependent on my desire to create a good painting. Um, so that is, I desire to create a good painting. Using that shade of blue would ruin the painting, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's it, right? That's... That's why I, I, I should use something else instead. But if I desire to create a tacky painting, well, using that shade of blue is then a good idea. Um, I, if, if I desire to create a tacky painting, then of course I, I should use the shade of blue. And moreover, uh, it's perfectly fine for me to create a tacky painting. So, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not like, basically, I'm not under any obligation to create good paintings. There is no reason independent of my desires and goals for me to create good paintings. Maybe I want to create good paintings, um, but uh, I, maybe I don't. And both of them are perfectly fine. Um, there is nothing wrong with creating bad art. Uh, maybe sometimes there are good reasons to create bad art, you know, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's just up to you, right? It, that's something that I think we would just allow. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of create whatever art you want. Um, now, I mean, I should say that this point 
that I've made here might be questioned. There is a, a common view actually that reasons reduce to values. So we would say that an agent S has a reason to do X if and only if Xing has a value. So if if some action would bring about something of value, then I have a reason to perform that action. Um, so on on you know if we, th there are views of you know reasons and so on where what I've said here isn't going to work. But you know I mean those are philosophically controversial. All I'm saying is there does seem to be, at least prima facie, a difference between morality and aesthetics here, in that there are moral obligations, but it doesn't seem like there are aesthetic obligations. And categorical obligations are arguably a source of queerness, in which case there is a queerness problem for the moral realist, which does not arise for the aesthetic realist. Um, so to put this another way, whereas the moral realist needs to show that there are both objective moral values and objective moral oughts, the aesthetic realist only needs to show that there are objective aesthetic values. Uh, and so they have less of a problem. So the argument uh, might go. All right, we've seen that there are parallels between, <clears throat> between moral realism and aesthetic realism. So this is a plausible context for proposing companions and guilt arguments. A companions and guilt argument attempts to defend or attack some disputed property P by arguing that it is relevantly similar to some other property Q about which there is less dispute. And so there are two directions we might take the companions and guilt argument uh, here. Let's say that we are aesthetic anti-realists. We, we deny that there are objective aesthetic values. Well, an aesthetic anti-realist might apply a companions in guilt argument in this way. We noted at the beginning that there are various features of moral discourse that are often taken to support moral realism. So there's, you know, the surface grammar of moral judgments, the fact that people make mistakes about morality and so on. But then we might notice, well, these same features are found in aesthetic discourse. And so the argument would go, um, look, aesthetic realism is implausible. So we should be sceptical that these features really support realism in any domain. So basically, the moral realist says, the fact that moral discourse has features A, B, C, that supports moral realism. The aesthetic anti-realist then points out that, well, aesthetic discourse also has features A, B, C, but we do not believe that there are objective aesthetic values, right? So with respect to features A, B, C, moral discourse and aesthetic discourse are companions in guilt. Um, they are on a par. And we don't believe that there are objective aesthetic values. So the fact that moral discourse has features ABC is not a good reason for being moral realists. Um, that's one way we might make a companions in guilt argument. But here's a slightly different argument. Let's say that we're moral realists. Let's say we start from the position of moral realism. Well, then we might use our commitment to moral realism as part of a companions in guilt argument in favour of aesthetic realism. Aesthetic realists object, for instance, that objective aesthetic values are objectionably queer. But this same queerness is found in moral values, and we have good reason to accept objective moral values. So the fact that aesthetic values are queer is not a good reason for doubting the existence of objective aesthetic values. So basically, the aesthetic anti-realist says, look, the fact that aesthetic values have properties D, E, F is good reason for doubting that they are objective. The moral realist responds, well, moral, moral values have properties D, E, F and moral values are objective. So possessing properties D, E, F does not show that something uh, is not objective. Um, and so, you know, we might well argue in, in that kind of way. Um, or, of course, uh, we might make the argument that... Uh, objective aesthetic values and objective moral values are not on a par, um, in which case we would we would deny that they are actually companions in guilt. Um, as I sort of suggested when I was talking about the queerness argument, we might say no, there are relevant differences um, between these uh, domains. Uh, but anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about for today. I'm going to wrap it up there. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everybody.